Hello, and welcome to Antiderivatives and Indefinite Integration. My name is Tuesday J. Johnson. I'm a lecturer at the University of Texas, El Paso, and an assistant professor at Doniana Community College. Uh, this comes to us from Chapter 4, Integration of Larson's 11th edition calculus text. Section 4.1, Antiderivatives and Indefinite Integration. I put this into two parts, and we're going to start with part one, the basics. In part two, I'm going to show the relationship between integration and differentiation, where we check our work using derivatives. But for now, the basics, what are antiderivatives and indefinite integration? So an antiderivative, anti-opposite of derivative, right? So a function capital F is an antiderivative of F on an interval I if f prime, so the derivative of capital F of x is equal to little f of x for all x and i. And like most math definitions, it's kind of weird. But remember, mathematicians are very specific. I use a capital F here for an antiderivative and the regular f for a function for the regular function. So we know we had the notation f prime for the derivative. Well, this is capital F prime. So the derivative of the antiderivative is the function. All right, let's look at representation. If capital F is an antiderivative, notice the indefinite article there, of little f on an interval i, then capital G is an antiderivative of little f on the interval i if and only if capital G is of the form g of x equals f of x plus c for all x and i where c is a constant. And what this says is all antiderivatives of a function differ only by a constant c. So all antiderivatives, remember there's only one derivative, but there are infinitely many antiderivatives, and that's because of the constant. We can't get it back. What's the derivative of every constant? Zero. So antiderivatives, we can't recover what was the original constant unless we have a little bit more information. But in general, we'll have many antiderivatives, and in specific cases, we can find what that value C is if we have enough information. Let's look at some examples. Just little easy examples. Find an antiderivative, an antiderivative, and then find the general antiderivative. So if we have a function y equals 3, nice little constant function, we ask ourselves, what has derivative equal to 3? Three? 3x does. So a possible antiderivative is capital Y, which equals 3x. In general, the antiderivative, notice the, a possible, so we're being very specific here. Once we add the plus c, the antiderivative is capital Y equals 3x plus c. A possible antiderivative is capital Y equals 3x. So we're always asking ourselves, what has derivative equal to 3? Oh, 3x does. But it could be 3x plus a constant, so we have to add the plus c. So now we ask ourselves, what has a derivative equal to 2x? We know that x squared does in general, because we found so many derivatives in this course so far. So a possible antiderivative maybe is capital F of x, which is x squared minus 3. Let's take the derivative and check and make sure. The derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of minus 3 is 0. Look at that. The derivative of capital F of x is 2x. In general, this minus 3, I just pulled it out of random space. In general, it could be any constant, because the derivative of any constant is 0, and the derivative of capital F of x equal x squared plus c is indeed 2x, exactly what we wanted it to be. 5x to the 4th. Well, what has derivative equal to 5x to the 4th? x to the 5th plus 7 does. But in general, x to the fifth plus any constant. And once again, since the derivative of any constant is zero, we use c, a capital C for an arbitrary constant. If you're using WebAssign like we do at UTEP, make sure it's a capital C and that you don't forget to type it in. Sometimes there's a C outside of the box. Sometimes there's not. When you're finding antiderivatives, it has to be a capital C. You know WebAssign is case sensitive. So let's look at some notations. Uh, let's look at the differential form of a derivative, and the differential form is dy dx, right? And this is just the change in y over the change in x. We use the d in place of the Greek delta. If the derivative dy dx equals f of x, then if we think of them in differentials, this is a fraction, and we could separate the numerator and denominator, multiplying appropriately. So I'm going to multiply both sides by dx. 
On the left, when I multiply by dx, I'm left with a dy. On the right, when I multiply by dx, I get f of x dx. Now we can find the antiderivative of both sides using the integration symbol, and it's an elongated s, and that's because integrals, antiderivatives, are sums. And so the elongated s is just adding up a bunch of areas, and we'll see that in the next section. So that is y is equal to the antiderivative of dy, okay, antiderivative of the derivative of y, which is the antiderivative or integral of f of x dx, which equals capital F of x plus c. Each piece has a, of this, this equation has a specific name. So the integrand, the thing inside the integral, is f of x. And f of x is always in a form of parentheses. If you think of the uh, integration symbol and the dx as my open parentheses, close parentheses, f of x is always in between them. The variable of integration is given by x, right? d whatever is right here. The antiderivative, sometimes called integral, is the capital F of x. It's the result. And the constant of integration is the capital C. So the term indefinite integral is a synonym for antiderivative. And indefinite integral, which I eventually shortened to integral, uh, so much easier to say and spell than antiderivative. A word is not a big fan of the word antiderivative in general. Differentiation and anti-differentiation are inverse operations of each other. That is, if you find the antiderivative of a function little f, then you take the derivative, you'll end back up at little f. Similarly, if you take a derivative, the antiderivative takes you back within a constant because we lose a track of specific constants through that process. So here's some basic integration rules. But you already know these. These are just written in a different form. What has derivative equal to zero? The antiderivative of zero with respect to x is just a constant. Uh, for any constant k, and we use the constant k because of the German language, as it turns out, the antiderivative of a constant dx. Well, what has derivative equal to a constant? kx does. So kx plus c is the antiderivative. Similarly to limits and derivatives, the constant can come out in front of the process of integration. So the integral of a constant times a function dx is the constant multiplied by the integral of f of x dx. The integral moves through sums and differences. Notice the dx also, both the integral distributes and the dx distributes in a, in a fashion. And rule number five, this is going to be our, our basic rule, just like we had a uh, power rule for derivatives. This is one step of the power rule for antiderivatives. The antiderivative of x to the n dx is x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And remember, when we were taking derivatives, right, the derivative of x to the n, we bring down the n, multiply, and subtract 1. Well, with antiderivatives, now we add one to the exponent and we divide by that new number. All right, so very similar opposite operation. So now we're gonna divide instead of multiply and we're gonna add one to the exponent instead of subtract one. Always plus C, notice, always plus C. Uh, why can't N be negative one? Well, we can't divide by zero. So this is true for every power except we cannot find the antiderivative of one over x dx at this time. We'll get there by the end of the semester, but not yet. It doesn't fit into this rule. All right, so let's find some antiderivatives. Uh, for each function, first we're gonna rewrite it, then we're gonna integrate, and then we're gonna simplify. So the antiderivative of the cube root of x dx, first I'll rewrite the cube root of x as x to the one third. Now I'll use my power rule and integrate. If I have the integral of x to the one-third dx, I add one to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. Don't forget the plus c. I write that at every step just so I don't forget it at the end. Then I simplify. The antiderivative of x to the one-third dx is x to the one-third plus one over one-third plus one plus c. We know that one-third plus one is four-thirds, both in the exponent and in the denominator. Dividing by four-thirds is the same as multiplying by three-fourths x to the power of four-thirds plus c would be our antiderivative, the answer 
that I would enter as my final uh, bit of work. 1 over 4x squared. Notice the 4 isn't squared, right? Just the, the x has the square on it. So when I rewrite it, I'll leave it as 1 fourth x to the negative 2 dx. That 1 fourth, uh, the constant multiple rule says it could come out in front. Uh, x to the negative 2, power rule, negative 2 is not negative 1, so I could use the power rule. I have 1 fourth out in front. The antiderivative of x to the negative 2 dx is x to the negative 2 plus 1 over negative 2 plus 1. And don't forget your constant. Negative 2 plus 1 is a negative 1, both here in the exponent and in the denominator. And that's how I get a negative 1 fourth. And then my x to the negative 1 I put in the denominator, right, as x to the positive 1. We always want to make a positive exponent when possible. Don't forget your plus c. Negative 1 over 4x plus c. And you could check by taking the derivative and making sure it equals the original uh, uh, integrand. 1 over x square root of x dx. Now remember, uh, x is to the first. The square root of x is to the 1 half. Uh, 1, and when you multiply two things with the same base, you add their exponents. So 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. They're both in the denominator, so when I rewrite, my 1 over x square root of x becomes the integral of x to the negative 3 halves dx. I use the power rule. I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, and I'm going to divide by that new exponent. Negative 3 halves plus 1 is a negative 1 half. When I simplify, don't forget the plus c at each stage. When I simplify, dividing by a negative 1 half is the same as multiplying by a negative 2. And x to the negative 1 half is a square root of x in the denominator. Don't forget your plus c. So the antiderivative of 1 over x square root of x is negative 2 over the square root of x plus c. Again, find the derivative and you can verify that you are correct. One of the things I love about math is you can always check your answer and make sure it's correct. Almost always check your answer. Sometimes it's harder to check the answer than you come up with it in the first place. But not in this case. All right, so the integral of x times x cubed plus 1. I don't have a product rule for integrals, and we're never going to have a product rule for integrals. Never. So just get used to it now. The first thing I'm going to do is simplify. x times x cubed is x to the fourth. x times 1 is x. So instead of finding the antiderivative of x times x cubed plus 1 dx, I'm going to rewrite it so that it looks like a polynomial. This is the antiderivative of x to the fourth plus x dx. Remember, we had a sum and difference rule that said I could take a look at the integral of x to the fourth dx plus the integral of x dx. And I didn't type it here because it does take a lot of room. That's just pure laziness on my part. Uh, but the integral of x to the fourth dx, I add one to the exponent, divide by that new value. The integral of x dx, right, that's x to the first. I add one to the exponent, divide by that new value. Because I found an antiderivative, I use a plus c for the constant. And to simplify, 4 plus 1 is 5. This is x to the fifth over 5. Uh, 1 plus 1 is 2, so we have x squared over 2 plus c. The final answer as I would enter it. Uh, the antiderivative of 1 over parentheses 3x all squared dx. Now notice this time the 3 is being squared, so I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to rewrite this as the integral of 1 over 9x squared dx. Factor out the 1 ninth. Because it's a constant, it moves past the uh, integ integration symbol, right? We can move it out in front. Uh, x squared in the denominator becomes x to the negative 2. So that's 1 ninth, the integral of x to the negative 2 dx. To integrate that, we have the 1 ninth. Add 1 to our exponent and divide by the new value, plus c. Let's see if we can clean that up a little bit. Negative 2 plus 1 is a negative 1. This is not 9 minus 1. Keep in mind, there are two separate fractions here. So I'm going to multiply. I'll end up with a negative 1 over 9x plus c as my antiderivative. Negative 1 power takes my x to the denominator. 9 times negative 1 makes the 1 ninth. Negative 1 ninth. All right, now I did this one uh, specifically because it looks as weird on WebAssign 
as it does here as I've typed it. Now, where does that fifth go with? What does it go to? Is that x to the fifth or is that the fifth root of x? And I'm here to tell you it is the fifth root of x. This is the antiderivative of 1 over x times the fifth root of x dx. It's just that typing, it doesn't slam that 5 into the little, little nook, into the index spot very well. So I wanted you to see one of these and know what it's supposed to be. That's 1, and that's a 1 fifth power. Multiplying two things with the same base, we add their exponents. So 1 plus 1 fifth is 6 fifths. And they're in the denominator. So it's x to the negative 6 fifths. When we integrate, I'm going to add 1. And that's going to be my new exponent and my new denominator, plus c. Cleaning it, cleaning it up, negative 6 fifths plus 1 becomes a negative 1 fifth. Dividing by a negative 1 fifth is the same as multiplying by a negative 5. x to the 1 fifth power becomes a fifth root of x in the denominator plus c. So if you're doing this problem on WebAssign, that's a fifth root, not a fifth power. There's no way, it's not even WebAssign's fault, there's just no way we could write that any better unless we use parentheses maybe, uh, but there it is. Oh, that's it for basics of antiderivatives and indefinite integration. On part two, I'm going to do more examples. We're going to integrate, and then I'm going to take the derivative of a couple of them. I'm going to show you the process. We'll take the derivative in order to check our work and make sure we're correct. Thanks for listening.